the second sermon <laughs> of a four-part series on the Overcomer. Just a side note, <clears throat> I do love that word, Overcomer, because people who are overcomers are committed people. And I, I do like that, I love that word. When I was going to Bible school, that there was a, a, a printout or a newsletter that entitled The Prairie Overcomer. <laughs> And uh, always appreciate it, love that word, because when they face, because overcomers, when they face obstacles and downfalls, they immediately start thinking, how do I solve this problem? That is commitment. But if there is no commitment, then their first thought is, how do I get out of this deal? Right. We all know that there are setbacks in life, like health issues financial crisis, relational issues, and the overcomer continues on because he or she is committed, he is persistent, he has this unshakable belief that eventually they are going to win. Right. That is what separates an overcomer from the rest. You see, faith plays an important role in the life of an overcomer. When it looks like the darkest hour, an overcomer never gives up. It's that faith that keeps him going. Because he understands and he stands in the promises of what Jesus says in John chapter 16, verse 33, which says this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. So be an overcomer. So I love the title of this series, Overcomer. Because living a life of an overcomer is saying, I'm depending on you, Jesus Christ, because you have overcome all. So my life is put on you. And our talk this morning is overcoming this epidemic Apathy. That was the title that was given to me. <laughs> We're going to be talking about apathy. How do you overcome this infectious problem of apathy? It is so infectious that it is plaguing the society that we live in. I think it is true. Someone said that we are the apathetic generation. Apathy is all around us. I just want to define what apathy is. Apathy is lack of interest, compassion, concern, or enthusiasm. I don't care. I don't want to get involved that much. That's apathy. In fact, let me go on to say that the inactivity and lethargy of this apathetic lifestyle is, I believe, fueled by materialism of our society and caused by the fear of what life is like outside of our comfort zone. And so we choose not to get involved. It's going to cost me. I don't know what's out there. And so we pull back. So we choose not to get involved. Good news that there is hope for our apathetic generation. That there's hope. For that, we're going to look at Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. I'm going to read the Word of God. And then the, draw some application from that story. This was motivated, this story that was told by Jesus was motivated by a question brought by the, an expert of the law, a lawyer who loves to lie. To, you know, how many, is there any lawyer here? No. Lawyers love to ask questions. <laughs> they, they like to test each other. They, 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 just, they just ask questions. But that's what it is. That's what motivated this story was, was a, a lawyer that came. So verse 25, on one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. <laughs> Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Typical lawyer. Love to ask questions. But he was testing Jesus on the subject 
of eternal life. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What is the least I have to do? What is the bare minimum? Notice what Jesus' response is. And he responded back in the form of a question. Have you ever been to a place where you ask a question and somebody respond back with a question? You know, a lot of the times when my wife and I, you know, after church, we go home and, and I said, do you want to go out for supper, for, for lunch? And, and she would respond back, do you want to go? <laughs> do you like that? Do you like people asking, you know, responding to you back with a question? Yeah, do you like to go? Do you want to go? Well, just make some decision. Amen. So he started asking this question. What is the least... I have to do. But notice what he said. Jesus said, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Verse 27, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your sword and with all your strength, with all your mind. That's the first requirement of having to, etern to inherit eternal life. Because that was the subject. How do I inherit eternal life? Number one, love your God. And then he went on to say, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the second part. And then Jesus said, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Now, you want to know what you need to do to inherit eternal life? Love God, love other people. That's the answer. And he answered and then that should have been the end of the story, right? That would have been a good ending. <laughs> Verse 29, but he wanted to justify himself. How many of you been in the place? I, I, I just need the approval of somebody else. I, I, I just need to see if somebody else will approve of me. I'm always seeking approval for somebody else. And so here's what he said, justifying himself. He wanted to justify himself. He wanted to look for Jesus' approval. And so he asks this question. And it's very interesting when you look at, at the dynamics of these questions that he asked because he said, who is my neighbor? <laughs> Jesus, I got the first part. I have to love God. But the second part, who is my neighbor? What do you think of that question? Who is your neighbor? I mean, who do I have to love? Do I have to love everybody? Verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho <clears throat> when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. You know, when I was reading that, just a little side note, when I was in high school, I, I did come across, you know, I think it was over lunchtime, and we, we would sit in our recess, and there was a bunch of guys who were huddled together, and they were in a circle. And I, I, you know, curious as I was, and I just come check out what was the commotion about. And came in here, and I watched this kid, and no kidding, got beaten the daylight out of him by another kid. That just wrecked me to the place when you see the bloody face and and, and people just circling at her and not doing anything about it. And this kid could have been killed. And, and when I look at, when I was reading this again last night, and that God brought that back to mind, that was many, many years ago. Do you know what it's like to see somebody get beaten up? They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and they went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, what did he do? He passed by. 
On the other side, so too a Levite, somebody who was helping out at the temple, when he came to the place and saw him, did exactly the same thing as the priest did, he passed by on the other side. Now of all people, Jesus went out and said the next verses, but a Samaritan. Really? Who is a Samaritan? Nobody wants to see themselves sit beside a Samaritan in church service on Sundays. The Jews have some kind of derogatory term for Samaritans. Not the nice one. But the Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. Then what's happened next? Instead of passing by, what did he do? He went to him. And bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and, oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and take care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. What a commitment. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of a robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Simple but powerful story that illustrates, especially we're going to be zeroing in on the two people, the priest and the Levite, because that is the topic of our discussion here this morning, is the fact of apathy. Because all the three men, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, all have the same experience. In other words, they saw the man naked, beaten up, and dying, lying in the ditch. All the three of them did see them. They were all moved with sympathy and compassion. But here's the difference. What Jesus said about the Samaritan, hear me out, what Jesus said about the Samaritan determined whether they were defined, the three men were defined by apathy or action. You see, it's possible for us to, to be sympathetic and be apathetic. When Jesus talked the story about the Samaritan, this was to define where and which group do you stand in. The priest saw the man, instead of going over to help him, he passed on to the other side. Then a Levite came down to the same road, saw the beaten up man, he did the same thing, he just passed on to the, to the other side. They may have said, I see this guy, but I do not want to get involved, there's too much at risk here. It's going to be dangerous for me. I know he is in a bad shape, but I did not want to get involved. Sympathetic and apathetic, no action. Here's the thing about apathy. We don't normally drift towards action. We normally drift towards apathy. Lack of interest. Being apathetic does not mean you don't see the situation. It doesn't mean you don't have sympathy. Being apathetic means in spite of what you see, in spite of how you feel, you walk away and do nothing about it at all. That's what it is. Apathy. Have you sit beside somebody who is apathetic? You know, when my, when my kids were little, they were involved in sports. And a couple of the older boys signed up in slow pitch. And, and, and I'm not saying anything about the sport of slow pitch, but sometimes I wonder if there's a sport. Anyways. <laughs> uh, so they, they sent the two boys out in the outfield. And I look at, I kid you not, I could have taken a picture of them. They were just, uh, just picking up dandelion flowers and, you know, just sitting around talking around. Just apathetic about everything, lack of interest, no concern with what's going on. And 
I remember one time one of the boys in the middle of the game because he wasn't doing nothing at all, like he was just sitting at the back, just standing there. He just walked over and said, Mom, is there any lunch? <laughs> <laughs> Get back in there, there's a game on right now. What game? Like, really? Very apathetic. <laughs> but here's the thing, because we don't normally drift towards action, we drift towards apathy. That is our makeup. Being apathetic doesn't mean, you know, okay, you see the situation, you feel the situation. Very apathetic, and you walk away doing nothing. But why is it? The question is why? Why is that so many of us find it so difficult to care? Why don't we care like Jesus called us to care? Well, let me give you some points from the outline that was given. Number one, the volume of information is so overwhelming. I mean, this thing here has revolutionized our world, our lives. You know, I can just slide this thing down right at my fingertip. You see all the news in the world. Like right now, I'm, I'm seeing it. There's some news here about the hurricane that is happening on the southern, southern part of the states. Right there. So we are living in a different era when information, when text, when emails are at your fingertips. Which it, it, things have changed. You know, like I, like I said, I can get the current news that's happening just by the sliding of my finger down on my phone. And every day, every hour, as you spend your time on those phones or on your computer, we are exposed to tragedies, we are exposed to storms, to shootings, to abductions, 24-7. We are bombarded with so many things to care about. People knocking at my door, soliciting funds for different causes. Can you help me out? In fact, we had two yesterday. And then you go to your site on, on computer, you have this GoFundMe page to help out with the cause. We're so bombarded with information and it's so overwhelming, no wonder it is so difficult to care when there is so many things to care about. A lot of information. Secondly, we feel helpless to make a change. Who am I? I'm this one person. The truth is, many of you want to care about what you see. The truth is you like to do something, but you are thinking, I'm just one person. Who am I? I don't have a lot of money. I can't get to that place. I can't make a difference. Besides, I'm just trying to look after my own needs. I'm only one person. As many of you know, my life is pretty crazy right now. Yesterday, I had two people came over. One for marriage counseling and one for marriage relationship issues. I was tempted to say, man, I just can't. But what difference do I make? I'm trying to meet my own my needs. But the Samaritan man could have said, okay, I could be like the Levite and the priest. I could pass by, look at this person. I mean, I'm on a dangerous road. There's robbers and there's killers lurking on the side, you know, waiting to take my life. Why don't I just sit on my donkey and be comfortable and go home? That, that, that could have been the best thing for me to do.
Somebody else begged to differ. Let me tell you the story. A story was told of a 17-year-old, incredibly motivated, passionate girl by the name of Rachel Scott. At an early age, Rachel decided to de dedicate her life to caring about other people and spreading kindness and compassion. After her tragic death at the Columbine High School mass shooting in Colorado, her parents decided to create the Rachel Challenge Program which reached over 17 million people with a message of acceptance by challenging the excuse, I can't make very much of a difference. Rachel was not rich or famous. She didn't start any charity. She just cared and we can do the same thing Rachel is teaching us some important lessons that it's the small things that we do in our everyday lives that help us break out of the apathy cocoon. And here's the third point. Why we don't care like Jesus wanted us to care. And perhaps the most relevant and painful. We are blessed and cursed at the same time with comfort. What do I mean? The most comfortable thing for the Samaritan man is to do, as I mentioned, to stay on this donkey. Don't get involved. Just ride on off. What I mean the best thing to do. But we understand this. Comfort is what we will lean on. Right? When the testing, when the time comes, we lean heavily on comfort. We are blessed with comfort. This thing does not only give you all the updates of the news and stuff happening, the bad stuff happening in the world, but on my phone I got different apps. Recently, I've been using those apps. <coughs> for people to deliver food to my home. <laughs> you know, I got pasta and pizza app. You, 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 you just get on the app and then you, you, you said, can you deliver them in half hour? I, I, I'm not using them, I'm not asking people to deliver food to my home because I got a lot of money to spend. I just did it because I don't know how to cook. I'm, I'm just being honest. <laughs> I'm not begging you to bring food to my home. I'm not doing that. <laughs> but my point is this. We become so comfortable. It's better to stay at home on your warm, you know, like see, and you, and you can get this ordering stuff for you. You can get that app to deliver food to you in half an hour. Comfort. You can stay at the comfort of your home and you can do that. In fact, you can go on Amazon. You can go on Kijiji. One of my boys, he loves to buy stuff on Amazon and on Kijiji. And one of the boys, you know his favorite store? Value Village. <laughs> He said to me, Dad, I'm going shopping. Where? And value village. <laughs> Is there some kind of a high end? He loves value village. In fact, he brought me a couple of things from, high, from value village, some gadgets that he said, it cost five bucks. Very, <laughs> very smart. <laughs> and, and, and so we, we are blessed with comfort. But comfort can also lead you to apathy. That's where the curse comes in. That is where the, because the more comfortable our lives become, the more 
it leads into apathy. The more self-centered we are, the more focused we become. You know, someone, someone said that comfort is like a drug. When you get a little bit of it, you want a little bit more, a little bit more, before you know you're actually trying to leverage God and say, God, here's what I want. Please take care of my needs. I want to go to a church that will not judge me. I want to go to a church, I want to go to this, that, that I will not get, you know, involved. I'll just sit there and enjoy. I want this, I want that, and you begin to leverage what your position in Christ. I don't want to get hurt. But God, I want you to do whatever it takes to make me more comfortable because we are blessed and cursed with comfort. So be careful, people. Yes, this thing is comfortable, but it can lead you to a place of apathy. We don't care no more. We're too comfortable. Many of us can agree. We have been blessed with comfort. We do. But comfort can also lead to a curse. And we can be desensitized with the need around us and the things that go. So how do we overcome this attitude of apathy? Here's a point. I think Pastor John put that in the study guide. We consistently expose ourselves to something that creates a righteous discomfort. How do we overcome this attitude of apathy? How do you do that? Consistently expose yourself to something that creates a righteous discomfort. I heard a pastor called many years ago. In fact, it didn't take me long to grab hold of that idea. You know, pastors say that this is your holy discontent. Some of you who are old enough can remember the cartoon character by the name of Popeye the Sailor. He had a girlfriend by the name of Olive Oil. Right, now, you can make something out of that. Go ahead. I don't care. Popeye will say this phrase. And a lot of times that Popeye will say, that's all I can stand. I can't stand no more. <laughs> and then he would open a can of spinach. <laughs> There's some magic with spinach, you know, it gives you power. <laughs> because there is a girlfriend that I need to deliver from whatever it is, olive oil. So I got to have my can of spinach. So I can't stand. There's no more. So that's what that, to me, that's what righteous discomfort is. Here's the, the definition, righteous discomfort. The whole idea is that when there is something that grips you and wrecks you or hurts you and you know it breaks the heart of God and you say, that is wrong. This cannot be. It should not be this way in the church. It should not be this way in the world. I am not going to allow this to happen. You are so gripped with a passion for God to do something about it. I can't stand this no more. And whatever it is that creates a righteous discomfort in you, you have to consistently expose yourself to that. And that is one of the good things about short-term missions. I, I hear that there's some of you who there's this meeting afterwards to go to New York. That there's some good, good things that come out of short mission, term missions. But you need to consistently expose yourself to that place where that holy discontent continues to bubble or fire it up from inside of you. So I'm glad that you're looking into that and taking in some of these opportunities and sometimes that that's where you're going to find your holy discontent your righteous discomfort because you see if there is a lack of consistency there will be a lack of interest and before you know it you drift back to the 
comfortable life. Bills to pay, groceries to shop, meals to cook, meetings to attend, D groups to prepare for. We are back into this. So how do we consistently expose ourselves to something that creates right this discomfort, your holy discontent? How do you come to that pop eye moment? Number one, focus on something. There's so many things in this world that can move your heart or can grab your attention. You can be moved deeply on the lives of the unborn. Some it's racial injustice, some is human trafficking, some help giving clean water, drinking water to people around the world. Some as you will go to New York to help feed the poor, the hungry, the desperate, the destitute. For some it's cancer research. You lost someone that you love and now you want to help them out. Some of you is adopting children and helping them find a good and strong homes. Some of you are involved in student ministry. Your heart weeps for those teenagers to help them find the fullness of Christ in their lives. Maybe, as I mentioned, overseas mission. So many things we could be passionate about. Here's what we have to understand. There's so many things that will catch your attention. But there are a few things that captures your heart. Focus on those things. Focus on those things. God gave you those values to make a difference in this world. Jesus was so focused when he came to this earth to do, and that is to show the love of his Father to this world so that they can be set free. He was so focused. Yes, you can make a difference in a lot of places, but if you allow the Holy Spirit to focus your passion, your holy discontent, your righteous discomfort, you allow the Holy Spirit to do that, you can make a big difference. Just like Rachel Scott. You want to know what my passion is? Since the day I met Jesus Christ and gave my life to him, I've never gotten over the fact that, God, you have been so good to me. Your good, good grace have over impressed and influenced me in my life. I've been so blessed beyond measure. And I thank him how I thank him, oh, how I thank him every day for seeking me out for saving my soul. He called me into full-time ministry. He blessed me with a God-fearing wife. Gifted us with three kids. He surrounded me with a great church family and a compelling vision to pursue. Why am I telling you this? Because of this fundamental conviction in me that I am absolutely conf confident that people far from God are better off with Jesus. Yeah. Passionate about raising the value of evangelism in the local church because it is so easy to be apathetic about the value of reaching the lost people for Jesus Christ. Especially as a pastor, as I shared to you yesterday, there is so many voices competing for our attention. We've got people saying, marry me, teach me, lead me, help me, grow me in my faith. It matters that you, I raise the value of evangelism and discipleship in this church so that we can continue to make headway in a broken world. Yeah. For the redemption of men and women. And for boys and girls, it matters to our Heavenly Father who gave up his very best. The life of his son to buy back human beings whom he loves so much. That is my righteous discomfort. That is my holy discontent. That's my Popeye moment. Focus on something, people. Let me tell you something, when you begin to focus on something that you are passionate about, hear me out, 
the enemy is going to whisper in your ear and tell you that you will not make a difference. That you are not good enough. But a holy discontent, a righteous discomfort, find a way. Apathy makes excuses. When you channel your focus, suddenly you're going to see the Holy Spirit move. Focus on something. Here's the last point. Embrace your righteous discomfort. I want to end with that point. Embrace your righteous discomfort. Let me give you some examples from the scriptures. Moses embraces righteous discomfort. One day Moses said, he looked at, again, the same thing. Moses looked at his own people. He got, you know, one of the Hebrew people of his own race get a beaten by one of the, the Egyptians. And he looked at that, it come to the place when he said to himself, it's not right that my people are treated this way. Let my people go. Moses had a Popeye moment. I can't stand this no more. David, he embraced his holy discontent, his righteous discomfort. A little shepherd boy, what did he do? Whole army, Hebrew army was afraid to fight Goliath. And David came into the front, to the battleground. He hears Goliath trash talking the people of God. And he looked at the giant and he said, And who are you to come against the army of my living God? He had his Popeye moment. I can't stand this no more. Nehemiah, in serving the king of the palace, broken hearted over the walls of his home city. Through miraculous intervention, he went back and organized a rally around among his people. And he said this, get up and fight. Fight for your family. Fight for your city. Fight for your people. He had a pop high moment. I can't stand it no more. One day Jesus walks up and overlooked Jerusalem. He broke down and he cried and he wept. He cries out to his God, these people are like sheep without a shepherd. I am the good shepherd, he said, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus had his Popeye moment. Paul said in Romans chapter 9 verses 1 to 2, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people. He had his Popeye moment. Martin Luther King Jr. could not stand racial discrimination. His holy discontent brought him to his Popeye moment. It should not be this way, he said, where people are discriminated based on the color of their skin. That the people should live like this in America. This is not right with God, and I have to do something about it. He had his Popeye moment. Bob Pierce, founder of World, founder of World Vision, Samaritan person, when he was traveling around preaching the gospel in Korea, he saw these children in the Korean War dying without food, without parents, wrecked him. His holy discontent brought him to his Popeye moment. He ended up creating this sponsorship program around the world where people could send money to World Vision, where they can care for people, the least of these around the world, making sure that they have something to eat and have access to education, access to Jesus Christ. This is the great line that Bob Pierce said, God, let my heart be broken by things that break your heart. As I close, I'm going to ask you and challenge you with this question. What wrecks you? What is it that stirs passion inside of you? What is it that brings that holy discontent in wherever you are? 
where you go, it should not be this way. I want to move in the direction that will make a difference. And so help me, God, because I can't stand it anymore. The epidemic of apathy. Move away from that and find your holy discontent, the thing that you're passionate about. And watch the Holy Spirit bless your life beyond measure. Thank you for the privilege and the opportunity. Thank you for joining us at Mosaic Church. If you have been blessed by today's message, or if you have made the decision to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please let us know about it. Email us at mosaicloyd at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. If you wish to know more about our church, you may visit us online at www.mosaicloyd.com. God bless you. See you again next week.